So church to the screens, Hebrews chapter six. Remember, we started this, one of the most controversial uh, portions of the entire Bible. It ought not to be that way, but it is. Uh, it shouldn't be. But denominational influence has really influenced so many in the way that this is interpreted. So as we read this, remember context in Bible studies king. Context. Always read in context. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, the basics. Let us go on to completion or perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And this we will do if God permits. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Powerful. Father, we pray now for your presence. God, we just love the fact that here we are in the middle of the week, having the freedom to gather. We cherish that. We no longer take that for granted. And Lord, we just pray now that you would be our teacher. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. So we're looking at a message that the last time we were uh, together on this one, it's quite interesting. We looked at uh, this message through this portion of scripture, listen carefully, uh, that is titled, Who Are Those Who Can Never Be Saved? See, so, well, that's a weird thing to say. Can't, can't everybody or anybody be saved? Well, the answer is yes. But the challenge that's before us, as the author of the book of Hebrews just stated to us, is that there is a person, there is an individual, those who have gone through the process of being associated with the things of faith, being associated with the things of God, um, having a Bible, let's just put it this way, they've got a Bible, they've gone to church, uh, they did that for some length of time, and um, they've come to the conclusion that it's not enough, Jesus is not enough that what they really need to experience is maybe what they had before. Some form of liturgical setting, maybe it was candles and, and icons and uh, a procedure. Yeah, yeah, that's what we need. We need to go back to that. Or in this case, the letter to the book of Hebrews, written, written to Hebrews who came out of man-made Judaism, into a knowledge of Jesus Christ, but the author is warning them about going back. If you leave and go back to what you came out of, there's nothing left for you. There's no other place to go, if that makes some sense to you, right? If you, if you depart from this and go to that, having studied all that you've studied as, as a Jew, and you've looked at the Old Testament prophets and you've concluded, yes, it is Jesus. And you make that natural, listen, it's not a jump, it's a natural progression out of the Old Testament into the new to, dis, to discern, to discover that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophetic scriptures. That when David talked about the Messiah, it turned out to be Jesus. When Daniel talked about the Messiah, turned out to be Jesus. When, Mo when Moses talked about the Messiah, it turned out, you know what I'm saying, the fulfillment of the prophets. That's why Jesus Christ himself on resurrection afternoon in Luke chapter 24, you can read it later, it's awesome, it's so fun, that as two disciples were heading home that evening on resurrection day, now it's night and they gotta get back home, it's getting dark and they're walking to Emmaus on that road, 
that Jesus suddenly appears with them and walks with them, and he begins to question them about, why are you so bummed out? What's going on? Don't, aren't you aware of what, what's happened? And Jesus says to them, what's going on? What, what happened? And they began to say, it's all about Jesus. He did this. He was mighty before God and man. And uh, he had taught us the way. He had performed miracles. And he did all of these things. He was betrayed and crucified. And, you know, there was a rumor that uh, three days later he'd rise from the dead. But, you know, now it's Sunday night and here we are. We're heading home and we had hopes that he was the Messiah and... Now well, all hopes are dashed and they're all bummed out. And Jesus says to them, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the scriptures and the prophets foretold. Amen. And the Bible there says that Jesus began to open up to them from the Old Testament and the prophets that he was in fact the Messiah. It's the Bible that announces who Jesus Christ is, not man, not us. We repeat what we learn. It's the Bible, I love that. It's the Bible that announces to you and I that God would send us his only glorified son, that it would be Jesus who would die in our place for our sins. It would be Jesus who would be resurrected from the dead. And that fact of that gospel and the power of that gospel well, it's what we've been learning on Sundays. That there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And the answer of the scripture is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why as a believer, when we research the Bible, it's a funny thing. We get satisfied with the scriptures, but at the same time, we get hungry for more. Remember when Jesus said, if you eat of what I give you, you won't be hungry anymore? That is true, but it's not true. It's true, but what he gives, I want more, <laughs> all right? He gives and you're satisfied, but you want more of him. What he meant by that was, is that the bread that I give, it will so satisfy your soul, you'll have no need to look anywhere else. So somebody might say, I'm gonna study all of the world religions and I'm gonna include Christianity in that group. Go ahead, and knock yourself out. But uh, can I say it this way? There's no better deal in town than what Jesus Christ offers. And so when we look at this portion of scripture, this is what we know so far. This is what we've studied. We looked in verse four last time that those who put themselves in an impossible situation are those who can never be saved. Meaning this, verse four, chapter six, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Meaning this, that these Hebrews understood the scriptures and came over to, or experienced the fulfillment of, understood, in the enlightenment of the word, they recognized, yeah, this is Jesus, yes, this is the Messiah. And so when we look at what is being declared, notice in verse four, that they've been enlightened, They've tasted, they were partakers. They sampled everything that you and I sample as believers, but for them, as Paul or the author, I think it's Paul, doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Whoever the author of the book of Hebrews is, warned earlier that you better mix what you believe with faith. What you hear, mix it with faith. What you're studying, mix it with faith. They, this group, whoever they are, fail to do that. And there's a, ish, a warning being issued here of great power. We saw this, that they were looking back to the past. That's why he announces, it's impossible. If you've been once enlightened, listen, there's no more light to turn on. You've heard the truth. So for example, you know people who do not believe in Jesus. They really don't. They might say they do, they know the gospel, they can repeat it back to you, but does the gospel govern their life? Nah, they just, they're very familiar with the things of Jesus. They've been enlightened, meaning they've become knowledgeable, 
They've heard that he's the way, the truth, and the life, or that he is the one and only Savior. They, they know this. They can tell you this. But has it, does it affect their lives? So they began to gravitate backward. We'd learned last time also that they were able to know the difference. They understood that there was a difference in the life of, of being religious versus relationship. They witnessed it. They saw it. They knew that whatever was going on regarding this Christ and his followers, that it's deeper and it's more real than any religious regime that you could be under the influence of or, or give allegiance to. They knew this, but it didn't change their lives. They knew the difference. And then last time we saw also that they were familiar with what we would call church life. This is New Testament stuff here, church. The book of Hebrews, notice, is in your New Testament. They saw the church born. These were believers who they knew about Pentecost. They knew about the moving of the Holy Spirit, who we'll talk about tonight. But they tasted of the heavenly gift, is the announcement that's made. So they had the answers. Today, it's a very scary thing to be able to have all the answers. Listen, this is a, we're in a very critical uh, state as a church in the world. And that is, when we can have seminaries that discredit the word of God. I have a dear friend who's, well, it's been years actually since we talked. They, it's just, the whole experience of going to, I'm not gonna mention the name of the school, but somebody talked to him, you gotta go. No one's gonna listen to you unless you get a doctorate. And the guy was pastoring a church of thousands of people. God's, God's hand was on him. But somebody got to him, he let somebody into his life who said to him, you need to keep doing what you're doing, but you gotta get a doctorate if you're really gonna move on in your ministry life to really be a success. So he went to a major Christian seminary and wound up being taught by professors who discredited the book of Isaiah. They began to teach that Genesis was poetic. Is Israel an actual viable nation? These are the things that he was telling me, that he was learning. And you would say, but he was strong, right? With, with all of, he was strong and he made it through, right? Answer, no, did not. We need to be so careful in the, the days in which we're in right now, days, D-A-Z-E, <laughs> the days in which we're in right now, because there's nothing that can replace the authenticity and the fact and the truth of God's word, but everything else dresses itself up so fanciful and so attractive with all of the what. And it begins to pull you away from the truth of God's word. Be very, very careful about that. We saw in closing last time that they were uh, content to be an outsider. It said that they had become partakers of the Holy Spirit. We saw that the word partaker in the Greek language means to share in or to be companions with others along the way. Imagine that for a moment. Imagine a journey and there's others with you. Um, that they were witnesses of the same things that you have been. That they saw the same things. The same things were presented to them. They heard the same music. They heard the same message. But what happened was they were okay, listen, with a question mark that was in their heart, I believe, by the Holy Spirit saying, you need to make sure that you're a true follower. I think God speaks like that to all people. You need to make sure you're, you're following me. You need to make sure, check, check yourself against the word. The Bible tells us for us to examine ourselves to determine whether we are in the faith or not. Did you know that? That's a good thing. That's a strong thing. So we'll pick it up now, church. It's verse five, and it's this. Those who sample the influence of the Holy Spirit. Who are those who can never be saved? They've sampled the Holy Spirit, but they've never taken in of the Holy Spirit. 
The Bible tells us here in verse five, just very few words and we'll go off from here. And that is they and the group that we're speaking of have tasted. They didn't consume, they tasted. It's like going down the aisle at Costco. At least you used to. Do they still do it anymore? I gave up on Costco when they they stopped giving away free food. Um, It used to be where you could go to Costco and basically get lunch for free going down the aisles. You got, listen, you got a slice of pizza. It was that big. You got a little cup of juice, right? But if you kept going down each and every aisle, eventually you get filled up. But you didn't get a lot of what was there. They had this issue, or at least the apostle is warning them about, sampling. Now, how would that manifest itself today in our lives? How would we sample the things of the Holy Spirit and not actually be a true follower of Christ? You know, we could sample things of the Holy Spirit by... um, by what excites us, that we follow every um, type of service that's going on or around because it's very thrilling. Imagine right now if people really, and I think God's grace is just holding this back, but people are at a level of fear and of boredom that if, if Satan were to launch, as is promised in the Bible, as Jesus warned us, the days of, of de- deceiving spirits and, spirits and doctrines of demons, false teachers, imagine the manifestation of people who would do really tremendous things, very charismatic, doing miraculous types of things, and you could easily mistake it for the work of God. I understand that. I'm a human too. That we have this need and this person coming through town is, is preaching and teaching the lights and the uh, crowds, but their doctrine is a little off. And, and, but you'll overlook that because listen to him or listen to her. Watch, look at that. Did you see that? That guy's, you know, he, he was blind and now he can see or his arm grew or whatever, I don't know. But listen, if... if If Pharaoh's magicians can do miracles, that's under the power of Satan. How will you ever know but by the knowledge of the word of God? And so we're coming up on days that I pray that at least you at this church are ready to take on because when you're really hurting and somebody offers you the answer to your pain, but they are a little off on Jesus, but you look this way and you look that way and you just go for what they're offering... That's no different than Peter denying Jesus around that fire as Jesus had been betrayed. No, listen, the group that's in trouble here are those who have sampled the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a hold of them. Look at verse 5, we learn this, that they never moved on further with Jesus. That's built in the entire structure of the, of the verbiage that's presented here, that they have tasted And so that they've never moved further along with Jesus. They've never grown. They never put themselves in that place. Somebody, we were talking recently about the power of the Holy Spirit. And how bad you and I need the power of the Holy Spirit. But I have to qualify that statement. When we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Now so, make sure this is clear. Don't raise your hand. Oh, it's okay. Raise your hand. If If you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, raise your hand. Okay, so put your hand down. By you, by you saying so, you're, you're communicating to us, yes, I've accepted Christ. I understand what you're saying. He died on the cross for my sins. Yes, I made him the Lord of my life. He's my savior. That's what we assume by your hand going up. We just did that collectively for a moment. In that moment that you did accept Christ, whenever that moment was, According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit moved inside of you. By the way, listen, you may or may not have felt anything in that moment. Most people don't. Some people say they do. Great for them. That's awesome. I didn't feel anything. Most people don't. Some people, you know, they're like, oh, whatever. I don't know. But when you accept Christ, the Bible makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 12 that that's a one-time event. 
He moves in. He doesn't move in to move out, to move back in, to move out, to move back in. Some people think that they have to get saved every week. No, you don't. That just tells us that you had a really rough week. No, that happens once. He comes inside never to leave you. In fact, it's beautiful. Technically, it's his job to stay inside of you and to present you to Jesus either at death or at the rapture. The Holy Spirit will deposit you into the hands of Christ at the coming of the Lord. Boy, that'd be awesome. Tonight would be a great night for that. I'm sure it's warmer in heaven than it is here tonight. But they didn't move on. They didn't move on. They tasted. They weren't serious about the things of God. The Holy Spirit to live inside of you is to seal you into the day of redemption. It's beautiful. He's not going to leave you. You can try all you want to run away from him. You're not going to succeed. You're just going to wear yourself out, get a bloody nose. It's a brutal life. Don't do it. Just cooperate. He's, he knows exactly what he's doing. He saved you. You're going to heaven. And... Uh, He wants to use you. Now, here's the part that's awesome regarding moving on. These people never did this. The warning goes out to those who never do what I'm about to say. They were never saved. The Spirit of God was never in them for the next thing to happen, which must happen for us, is that the Holy Spirit comes upon us for power. You can call it whatever term you want. It goes by many terms, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Notice, the baptism of of the Holy Spirit. I have to say it that way because the Bible tells us it is the Holy Spirit who baptized us into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12. But when we talk about the coming upon for power, again, it's loosely used as, oh, they were baptized in the Spirit. Well, we need to be careful with the terminology. The Spirit came upon them. Okay, Book of Acts, clearly. Uh, Ephesians, many places, absolutely. Uh, Whatever term, listen, we're talking about in the Greek what is E-P-I, epi. The moment you were saved, that's the Greek word spelled E-N. That means to dwell inside. You cannot have the Holy Spirit come upon you, E-P-I, unless you have first been E-N dwelt within by the Holy Spirit. Once you're a believer, the next thing is the power of God to come upon you. But the power of God's not going to come upon you unless you need power. If you're going to follow Jesus at a distance, listen, you may, you're, you're, you're going to heaven. But if you don't plan on serving God, listen, there's, there's no reason to put gasoline in the car if you're not going to drive it. You say, well, Jack, I want to serve the Lord. I remember this as, as, as clear as, as today. It's, Pastor Chuck said so many years ago, if you want to see the power of God move, you've got, and, you, and, and, and he said, look at it like a, like a car. As a car goes, try to turn the wheel of a car when it's not moving. Well, gosh, you know what? Everybody's got power sneering. But I have a 67 Volkswagen. It's old and it does not have power steering. It's a little tiny car. It's super light. Four guys can pick it up. But here's the deal. When it's sitting uh, just static, it's a little car, but try to turn the steering wheel without it moving. You can't do it. If you want God to use you, then present yourself to him, Christian, and get ready for an amazing life. Why? Because that's where you've placed yourself in the atmosphere of needing to be used by God. So we'll either choose, listen, dependence upon God and we'll see his power come down in that thing that he's called us to do. We step out in faith. As soon as the car starts moving, you can control it. But as long as it's parked, you can't turn the wheel. If you're willing, the Spirit of God comes upon you to use you in what he is stirring up in your heart to do. But listen, Christianity never works if you're going to decide to be a spectator. It never works. 
Oh, Christianity, I don't, I don't get it. It's because, listen, you never presented yourself to him. Are you going to go to heaven? Yep. But are you going to be bored all along the way until you get there? Sadly, yes. Why live like that? He wants to empower you. These here tasted. They just took a little sample, like at the end of Costco Isle, and that was fine for them, and they never went on any further. And we know people like this. We just don't want to be people like this. Make sure you're not. Secondly, under this, they never took in deeper the word of Jesus. Look at verse 5. It says that they tasted. The Bible says that they have tasted the good word of God. What does that mean? It means they actually sat and they listened to the word of God being taught. And they said, wow, that was, that was powerful. That was very instructive. That was very meaningful. Or maybe they even memorized a certain category of scriptures for whatever reasons. It didn't take root. It was more recreational, or it was more, this is what we do. It's like, well, I come from a long line of religious people, and I'm sure I'm going to raise my kids the same way that I was raised, the way my parents were raised, and that's what we do. That's scary and dangerous. Watch out for that. No, they, listen, they did not go deeper with Jesus and that is something that is, is absolutely uh, remarkable and beautiful. Um, so Lisa and I were just talking the other day about how, because uh, there's a lot of talk these days about revival. You see it all over the place right now. We look back to our days uh, at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa uh, with Pastor Chuck Smith and the Jesus movement uh, revival and all that stuff. And... If you go back and listen to sermons, because they're available, they're so simple. They're just so simple. And uh, it, it, you listen to Chuck, and, and now I pray because of your devotion to the word, you've grown, we've all grown. But when you go back to a message that was delivered by him 30 years ago, you're listening and you go, it's beautiful, but it's so simple. And I actually love that. When we get in a, in a culture of enter, an entertainment, we want some bells and whistles and rockets to go off. You gotta remember, Pastor Chuck Smith, this was a move of God. And if it wasn't Chuck Smith, it, it, God would have used a donkey. He was gonna move. God was gonna move. The culture had reached a place where young people were dying. And the nation was coming apart. Somebody must have been praying, or God leaned back and called up the prayers of, of previous saints, but he began to move. That's a sovereign move of God. Nobody causes it to happen. I'm going to step on some toes right now, but get them out there. Just let me jump on them. <laughs> have you ever driven by a church and on the marquee of the church, it says, revival next Sunday night. You can't do that. I mean, you can, put a, you can put that on a marquee, but you can't cause a revival to happen. You can be willing to whatever, whatever God wants you to do, to, to be willing to do, but you can't say there's going to be a revival next Sunday night. It's the work of the Holy Spirit of God, and he does that beautifully by interruption. He just interrupts. We've got our plan. God laughs at our plans. <laughs> this is the way we've always done it, and God says, that's why I'm going to shake it up. And so you see such a simple, clear gospel preached that the religionists would listen to and say, that's so simple. That's, that's kind of ridiculous. But God had a plan. And all of these hippies and all of these outcasts gathered. And like we're seeing in the news today, it was quickly labeled as a revival. There's a revival. Um, what's interesting about that is, it, it, technically, if you study the actual discipline of revival in Scripture, um, that's actually not really what happened. Chuck Smith taught the Bible, and the lost, the lost got saved. That's not a revival. 
That's called an awakening. The church gets revived. It was very interesting. So people got saved, and it was a simple gospel. Fast forward, if you listen to sermons that Pastor Chuck preached before he went to heaven, they were deep. They were way deeper than what he preached 40 years ago. Are you hearing me? What happened? Nothing happened except this. Where they started, you've got a, you've got, well, I'll, I mean, look, in light of teenage hippies, he was an old man. And I mean, he was an old man. So first of all, that's a work of God. When an old man is speaking to young people and they're listening you can't get that happen at home. It's an act of God. And, and he didn't jump or he didn't pace on the stage back and forth. And he didn't. It was, he sat there. He sat there on a stool. And he read the book. Let's, let's, let's turn to Matthew chapter one. And people just sat there. And he would read the Bible. In those days, he would read the Bible and then he would start talking and he had almost quoted verbatim without expository on it and then he'd move on to the next chapter. That's how they started, but that's not how they finished. What happened? He grew as they grew. Why? Because both the pastor and the flock were following the same Messiah, Amen. right? And by the end of the story, I'll put it that way, they had grown and he had grown. And the beautiful thing about it being a real actual revival eventually is that those people that got saved grew. And from their growth, others were added to the church and went deep. This is important, church. We've got to move further on with Jesus and we've got to get deeper in the word with Jesus. He will unlock to you. Listen, some of you young people who are bored with life, I get it. I get it. You look around at all the stuff that's being offered. This, that. I mean, seriously. And you're tired. And you're thinking, man, there's nothing. There's just nothing to live for anymore. I want to announce to you. <laughs> I'm so happy to announce to you, you have no idea what you're talking about. There's a whole life to live. You just don't know about it yet. Because the God that made heaven and earth made you. And he's got a plan for your life and you've never experienced that plan. And when you do open yourself up to his plan, finally, after all of these decades, your life begins. You might say, Pastor, I'm 26 years old, I'm tired, and I'm, I, I, I don't see any purpose to go on any longer. Great, good, that's fantastic. Now God can go to work with you. Because you've tried everything else and you've come up empty. You've searched for everything else and it's dead. Hallelujah. Now he says, okay, let's, let's do it my way now. And he goes about putting his word into you, and he unlocks things. Isn't it amazing that you could read, you could read one chapter of the Bible every day for 30 days, one chapter. Let's just say, let's say it's, it's Proverbs 3. You read Proverbs 3 every day for one month. That's all you do. Every day you read it, you'll get something completely different out of it. I mean, you can even do that with a verse. You guys all know that. How does it do that? How does that? You could get 10 pastors to teach on the, the same verse and all their sermons would be different. Every single one of them different. How is that possible? Holy Spirit taking the word and taking us deeper. It's what he does. Absolutely spectacular how he does that. And of course, Jesus says that when the Holy Spirit comes to you, he will unlock to you the word of God. He will teach you about things to come. Wow. And then finally, before we 
prepare for communion, it's this. Verse five teaches us that they never looked to the finish line, that is to Jesus. It tells us there in verse five that in that tasting mode, they sampled the powers of the age to come. Wow, think of that. They actually contemplated. Listen, they thought, they knew, they heard. Christ is coming back. There's an eternity. There's a hell. And there's a heaven. I know all these things. I can answer all of the questions on the exam. If I were quizzed, I could give you the answers, right? The problem is, is that they never looked to the finish line. So the warning goes out to them. It's impossible to renew you back again to repentance. You say, well, pastor, did, did they lose their salvation? No, that's the beauty of this passage. What so many people have struggled with is that, oh, see this, see this collection of verses here in Hebrews 6? It teaches that you can lose your salvation. No, it doesn't. It announces to us that there, there are those who have salvation and there are those who don't. And if you are a faithful practicing Hebrew in the context of our book and you have your animal sacrifice and then you hear the message and you hear Christ and you, Jesus, my goodness, what? Oh, the prophets, yes. And you say, all that was pointing to him. He's here. And you embrace him as Lord and Savior. But watch, in due time, over the course of whatever goes on in life, you wind up becoming a little complacent with him. It's not that big of a deal, really. And I felt more at home offering animal blood sacrifices and doing my rituals and lighting my candles and, to, and, and doing, I felt more, I, if I need to touch that. I'm gonna go back to that. The author of this book would say, Number one, this proves that you were never saved, but you only sipped and tasted of these heavenly things. You were almost a Christian. But in the course of time, you went back to something. Even after you were enlightened, that means you understood. He's the fulfillment, but you go back. It's like this, and I'll wrap it up. It's like you... You're in love with someone. You're, 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 you're married or you're engaged or uh, you're, you hope you get engaged. <laughs> but you love, you love that person and you have a picture of them. And let's say you're, you're, you're traveling. You travel. And you're going to be away from them for a month. And you have a picture of them. And you, every hotel room on your uh, company trip, you, you put the picture of them in there in the the mirror at the hotel and you, you call them up on the phone and you're talking to them. And, and then you get back home and you, you land and you say, I'll, I'll meet you at Starbucks or no, that's some of the, <laughs> meet you at Canabrew, the Christian coffee company down the street. And, and uh, I'll meet you there. And uh, so, I'm a, I'm a guy, so I'm going to use my analogy. You make up your own. But So I get there, and I've had Lisa's picture with me for a month. And I get there, and she's sitting there at a table with her latte. And I run into the building, and I pull out the picture. And I kiss it. <laughs> and I look at her over there, and I kiss the picture. And I hold it to my heart. Listen, I would be an absolute lunatic if I did that. <laughs> Do you want to know why? The real deal is sitting right there at the table. Amen. You're not going to look at a picture, a shadow of what is to come, the Bible says about Jesus. That the Old Testament painted us a picture, and Paul the Apostle himself said to the Colossians, what was written in all of those things 
were, it was actually a shadow, an indicator of what was to come in Christ and the fulfillment of it all is in him. I wouldn't reach for the picture, I would reach for Lisa. Do you, do you understand? So once, listen, if I reach for Lisa and then go back instead to the picture, you see, that's insane, exactly. It means that my affection is not true to be applied to her, that I've got something wrong where I will embrace a picture. If you embrace the shadow, you're grabbing nothing that can fulfill. When Christ is here, take hold of him. Grab onto him. He's going, he's going like this to you. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. He's calling you, but you, you stand there and you look at a picture of him. You would drop the picture and jump into his arms. All right? If you get out of his arms and say, I don't need you anymore, I have this picture, then the announcement is made, you do know that there's nothing, there's nothing left that can save you. If you're rejecting him, then where are you gonna go? It's gonna, you can't find, it's impossible for you to find repentance and forgiveness somewhere else. He's here, he, you hear this. See, the Christian doesn't go. The Christian may backslide and get into trouble, but the Christian's very aware of backsliding. Backslidden Christians are saved. You can tell by how miserable they are. No, you're not going to lose your salvation because you backslide. It's not smart, but you're not going to lose your salvation. The, if God has saved you, he's set his Holy Spirit in you. That's not going to change. Amen. Thank you. Just make sure you have him. Amen. Make sure he has you. Amen. Be yielded to him. Let him take hold of you. Yes. Then what? <laughs> then you're going to cry out to him and say, I need your power for what you're calling me to do right now, I think. It's quite thrilling. A thought will enter your mind to pray for that sick person you see at the store, or maybe some friend you know, and you have this, something strikes you in the heart, and you know it's unique, you know it's not you. And then you get terrified. Let's all be honest, we get terrified in that instant. <gasps> what do I do? Ask for the power of the Spirit to come upon you. Don't be satisfied with tasting. Sipping and sampling. Let him take you completely. Amen. It's amazing that he's invisible right now to us, but not, you know? This whole thing is so spectacular. You know, we're living right now. We're doing what we do for him in some way, shape, or form, all of us as believers. But we're always aware and conscious of, of the invisible and the eternal. And that at some point in time, our physical lives will be over. And when that happens, we get to go to his world, his house, his element, as it were, the, the realm of the spirit. And so you and I often think, ooh, the realm of the spirit. You know what? I'm convinced now from the Bible, it's more real than this world is. Amen. Scientists will tell us that everything physical that you and I see, that there's more air, space, in between the molecules that make up the stuff that we can see, than the actual physical properties. This podium is probably probably about three feet tall, or three inches tall, if you remove the space in between the atoms that make this pulpit up. Did you know that? The wood, isn't that weird? So what are you, nuts? I see the wood, it's solid. I see, you can hit it. Listen, physics says what I'm hitting are the, are the molecules of the wood, but in between the molecules is space, is air. That if you were to remove that portion of the equation, 
this, this podium would be like three inches tall. And it would be real, really heavy, but three inches tall. You say, that's weird. Yeah, it is. But throughout God's creation, he's been flirting with our minds all along the way. You and I deal with invisible things all the time. We can't see them with our naked eye. Doesn't mean they're not there. It's amazing. I don't know where you were today, but um, it was crazy. Today here at church, it's, the snow melted before it hit the ground, but it snowed here today. And I don't know where you were at, but people were sending us pictures. It's snowing at my house. It's snowing. At... But you think about that. That's really weird because that was just water just floating down in a solid form. But by the time it hit the ground or when it did hit the ground, it went away. Where'd it go? I just saw it a moment ago. You tell your friends, come outside, it's snowing. And then they all run outside and there's nothing going on anymore. And they think, what are you, nuts? There's no evidence here. Think of, think, of, think of the world that you and I are living in both now and the one that we are going to inherit. The real part. The real part will be realized in its perfect totality, in its completion. So tonight, when we prepare our hearts for communion and worship, I, listen, I want to invite you to meet Jesus tonight if you've never met him. You say, whoa, what? How can that happen? I just told you, some things are invisible. Technically, he wants to meet the invisible you right now. The inside of you. He wants to meet you on the inside. How's that? We meet people on the outside. But what about the inside? It shouldn't be strange to us. We meet a lot of people. But the people that mean the most to us are the people that get inside of us. And we get inside of them. You know what I mean? That's to know someone. Me meet a lot of people. But you don't know many people. The people you know are the people who you've discovered who they are on the inside. That's you. And that you is who Jesus wants to meet tonight. He's awesome. 